this is this at the right place? Okay, very good. Bonjour. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you again to all of the members and friends of the Karma Tixum Chilling uh, Center, and thank you for being here today. Uh, you have a very precious opportunity uh, here in this place to practice and study uh, the Dharma, the genuine Dharma, and I'm happy that you're taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, I myself am uh, not a scholar. Uh, I am kind of a, a continuing student. Um, in fact, uh, I think that uh, I learn uh, best uh, when I'm trying to give a Dharma explanation. Yeah. It, uh, it causes me to study more. So uh, today I've been asked to, uh, uh, and tomorrow I've been asked to talk about the five paths of the Mahayana. Uh, I know all of the numbers can be confusing. Uh, we have the three jewels and the three yanas. Then we have the uh, four noble truths and the uh, four thoughts that turn the mind. Uh, we have the five paths. Uh, six perfections, and uh, then if you add more, they become ten perfections. Ten bodhisattva levels, or thirteen if you read the tantras. Uh, uh, then the twelve links of interdependent arising. The numbers are enough to make you a little crazy. Uh, but uh, I think there's a, a, a function and purpose behind the numbers. We have to remember that in the old days there weren't that many books, and that it was easier to remember something if you knew how many things there were to remember. Uh, so, uh, even though it seems a little bit dazzling to us, these uh, variety of numbers, uh, they served a purpose in the past and they're serving a purpose now. Uh, however, five is a little too much, so I brought my book. So there won't be any mistakes. Uh, I'd like to begin with a, a brief introduction. Uh, the point of all spiritual teachings is to relieve suffering and to bring happiness. All of the spiritual paths, both old and new, uh, have this as their purpose and thus all of the spiritual paths are to be respected and they are not to be uh, denigrated or criticized. Uh, this is an important point. When I took refuge 30 years ago with Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, he spoke about this. Uh, he said all of the world's religions are here for a reason and as a follower of the Dharma it is your uh, task to be uh, respectful for all of them. Of course, you should respect your brothers and sisters in the Dharma, uh, but you should also respect the followers of other religions. He said, you shouldn't think, oh, I'm a Buddhist, I'm better than they are. Uh, this is sometimes helpful because many people who become Buddhist used to be something else. And uh, then when they become Buddhist, they denigrate the tradition they came from. Uh, kind of like somebody who breaks up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Uh, they say, oh, the old boyfriend or girlfriend, they just weren't as good when that's not necessarily true. Uh, they weren't right for us, but that doesn't mean they're not good. So it's better to look forward than to look back. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, today, however, that being said, today I am speaking about Buddhism. Uh, all of you are familiar <laughs> with the story of, uh, of the Buddha. Uh, born as a prince in India 2,600 uh, years ago, he felt uh, dissatisfaction and restlessness uh, with his uh, life and left his home. He sought to find spiritual truth through meditation. He left home and practiced in solitude. And uh, in his uh, deepest meditation, he discovered and realized the true nature of his mind. Uh, this story, of course, we've heard many times. Uh, but I wonder sometimes if we don't uh, forget that his story is our story because uh, we too may not have been born as royalty but been born in good situation. Uh, we live in a place of plenty and, uh, and at some point in our life we feel dissatisfaction and we go searching. We search for spiritual truth. We may not leave home and go and sit under a tree uh, but we understand uh, the Buddha's restlessness and his dissatisfaction. Uh, so we uh, go on our spiritual search. And we try this and we try that. But eventually we find a path that suits us, that works for us. And once finding that teaching, we seek the pure lineage. Uh, the lineage that wasn't made up yesterday. 
uh, but one that has a great lineage of history and blessing. I think of lineages being like one candle lighting the other through time. So uh, the, the Buddha's enlightenment touched the hearts of his students, they became enlightened and then touched the hearts of their students and so forth. Uh, so uh, our life, you could say, is like the life of the Buddha. We leave uh, comfort to seek spiritual truth and uh, coming into contact with the pure lineage we practice with diligence. And someday we also will become, as the Buddha was, an awakened being. Now sometimes we think of the Buddha as being exalted and high. And we think, well, I could never be like that. I mean, I look in the mirror and there's no ushnisha on top of my head, the knot of hair. <laughs> there's no peaceful smile on my face. But the truth of the matter is that at some point in our lives, uh, we were exactly where the Buddha was at that same point in his life. Uh, the Buddha at one place in his life was just like we are now. He had happiness and sorrows and confusion too. So it's comforting for me to know that at one point in his life the Buddha was just like me. Uh, through his practice he overcame suffering and confusion. And now he serves as a beacon of hope to bring others to happiness. Uh, if he can do it, we can do it. Uh, when the Buddha was first asked to teach, uh, he taught uh, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, we reviewed these the other day. Uh, the first noble truth being suffering being part of life. Uh, the second is the cause of suffering, which is uh, clinging. Uh, the third is that because suffering has a cause, it has a solution. And the, uh, and the solution to suffering is undoing the cause, uh, letting go of clinging, in other words. Uh, the path, then, is the method uh, for undoing the cause of suffering. In other words, the method is, how do we let go? Uh, the key to all dharma is undoing the cause of suffering. Uh, we cling to many things, but the greatest thing we cling to is the concept of self. Uh, we're all familiar with self-clinging. Uh, so we sometimes call it selfishness. In the U.S., it's uh, exemplified by the phrase, you go my way or you take the highway. <laughs> so uh, we're trying to uh, resolve that problem. Uh, the uh, Fourth Noble Truth, these uh, methods, are sometimes enumerated as the, eight, uh, the eight noble, Eightfold Noble Paths, uh, such as uh, right intention, right speech, right action, and so forth. Uh, uh, but that eight's a little hard for me to remember. So I like to quote the Buddha's own words. He enumerated the path in four statements. Uh, Do no evil. Practice virtue. Tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Uh, the fourth statement is a summary, so we can set it aside. He's just saying, if you look for my teaching, this is it. There's no other. So uh, if uh, we do our best uh, to do no evil, this means not to hurt ourselves and not to hurt others. Uh, when we say to do uh, virtue, what we mean is uh, to take care of ourselves and to benefit others. And the, and the third statement is, uh, tame your mind. Uh, this makes sense because by taming our mind, we know what evil is and we know what virtue is. If our mind's not tamed, how will we know what is useful and what is harmful? So taming the mind is uh, most important. Uh, the Buddha himself said the reason for this. He said, mind is, mind is the monarch. It's the one who tells the speech and the body what to do. It's very hard for us to say, oh, I accidentally hit you. <laughs> you know, the kind of hitting where it's direct, <laughs> not just accidentally bumping someone. <laughs> where you can't just say, oh, sorry, that was an accident. Your mind told your hands what to do. And the, a very similar situation with the speech. Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes we say the wrong thing unintentionally, but if we uh, insult people and uh, say really negative t things to them intentionally, that's our mind telling our speech what to do. So if we want to change our actions and our speech, we need to change the mind. Uh, the first words of the collection of the Buddha's sayings is, uh, is really important in this area. The name of the, of the book is the Dhammapada, or the, the Path of the Buddha. This is the uh, very first collection of the Buddha's sayings ever collected. Uh, I like uh, one particular English translation. It's uh, very direct and very simple. The first sentence is, we are what we think. 
Uh, all that we are arises with our thoughts. And with our thoughts, we make the world. Uh, this is powerful. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. And with our thoughts, we make the world. Uh, nobody makes the world. We make it with how we think. Uh, and those of you who are familiar with the works of, uh, of uh, the playwright William Shakespeare can remember this is said in Hamlet. He says, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Yeah, so, uh, so a lot of people agree on this point. The next phrase of this same uh, uh, verse in the Dhammapada uh, tells more about how the mind makes the world. The Buddha says, if we think, speak, and act with a pure mind, happiness follows us. And if we think, speak, and act with an impure mind, suffering follows us. So reading this, we want to know, what's the pure mind and what's the impure mind? I mean, after all, if the impure mind brings suffering and the pure mind brings happiness, we want to do the right one. Uh, the, um, the, so the solution to this is uh, the uh, pure mind is the mind of selflessness and the impure mind is the selfish mind. Uh, so our goal in the Dharma is first to tame our thoughts. And by taming our thoughts, we eventually tame and then eliminate suffering. Uh, first, we've got to get a hold of our mind. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, my mind is a little bit out of control. I have a voice that says, do this, don't do that. And I get confused about what's right and what's not right. We have quite a lot of freedom in this world, so we have a lot of choices to make. Uh, in the old days, we didn't have so many choices. Uh, someone would tell us where to go and what to do. Uh, th but now we have more freedom, so we have more choices. But we also have more uncertainty about what the best thing to do is. And somehow we think that thinking will solve this for us. Uh, as uh, one lama said, uh, our biggest problem is that we think that thinking is very important. So in shamatha, we let go of thinking. The Sanskrit word is shamatha. In Tibetan, it's shine, English calm abiding. And so basically, it means pacification or tranquility. Uh, it's a very uh, good technique. It's a very good method to practice. Uh, because until the mind is tamed, it's like a ball set on the table. It has a tendency to roll. Uh, we spoke about uh, the technique of shamatha the other day, uh, placing the body in a place of ease. And we place the mind, then, in a place of ease. Whether we're sitting in a chair or sitting in the floor, we have uh, a solid uh, stable sitting position. Our back is uh, straight, which means it has its nice natural curves in it. Uh, the, uh, the shoulders are straight, but not up like a vulture. <laughs> the hands are placed uh, either lightly in the lap in what is called the position of the sutras with the left hand on the bottom and the right hand on the top. Or the hands can be uh, placed in the position of the tantras with the thumb touching the base of the ring finger and the hand closed in a light fist laid on the legs. The chin is tucked in slightly. This straightens the vertebrae in the neck. The, yeah. eyes, the eyes are cast downward a few feet ahead. You're not staring a hole in the floor, but you're gazing diff in a diffuse way. You're gazing generally in that area. The tip of the tongue can be touched to the uh, roof of the mouth behind the front teeth. All of these positions create ease in the body. We begin the shamatha by taking uh, one deep breath. And uh, then we can breathe through the nostrils, if possible, through the mouth if we're congested. And then after that one deep breath, we allow the breath to be natural. And we place our attention on the breath as it comes in and goes out. Uh, the words I use here are quite precise. Uh, I never use the word focus, and I never use the word concentrate because that puts too much effort. So what you do is you lightly place your attention. You let your attention rest on the breath as it comes in and goes out. And uh, as you do this, your mind will come to rest. Uh, what you will find as you practice this is that you will begin with short periods of attention followed by some periods of wandering. And this is very normal. 
yeah, because this is not something we're used to doing. In fact, in Tibetan, one of the words that is used to describe meditation is the word gom, G-O-M, gom. It means getting used to. We're getting used to our mind. We're becoming friends. Uh, so uh, as our attention uh, rests on the breath, sometimes it will wander off. It'll go into the past or into the future. Or it'll uh, focus on the now, like, what's going on? Uh, but the, the, uh, the key to the technique is to uh, touch the thoughts and let them go. Uh, the, uh, the key is to notice distraction and discard it. Uh, you do this very gently, not with a sense of punishment saying, bad meditator. You just notice it, the distraction, you touch it with your attention, let it go and return. Uh, so in this way we let go of any thought. Uh, and uh, this weakens the habits of self-clinging by weakening the thoughts of self-clinging. And in this way, the habit of self-clinging is weakened. With the space that this gives us in our minds, this allows us to start thinking about virtue and studying Dharma. Uh, while our minds are wild, it's hard to uh, look at our studies on Dharma. Uh, but being able to do this uh, shamatha shine tranquility by be able, being able to do this meditation, it allows us to think of virtue and study the Dharma. Uh, we can study the teachings of the Buddha about karma. We can learn the ten virtuous actions and the ten non-virtuous actions. We can know that instead of killing, we should protect lives. Instead of uh, telling lies, we should speak the truth with gentleness. Instead of stealing, we should be generous, and so forth. And this helps us to uh, mm, this helps us to correct our behavior and make our behavior less selfish. Uh, this is the first stage of Dharma. Uh, scholars connect it with uh, the Hinayana. The reason I say scholars is because the Buddha didn't start his lecture saying, "Today I will teach the Hinayana." Uh, the the Buddha taught for uh, more than 45 years, and he taught in question and answer format. Uh, so it takes a lot of study to study all of the sutras. Uh, so the great masters of the past have uh, studied his teachings and have uh, come, have, um, and now speak about them as being divided into Hinayana, Mahayana, and so forth. So uh, Hinayana is called the, uh, the path of individual liberation. Feeling some renunciation for samsara, we seek liberation. Uh, but we seek this for ourselves alone. Disliking the pain of samsara, we seek nirvana or peace. Uh, through taming our mind and uh, good action, we can attain some measure of peace. Uh, but the peace we attain through this method is not a complete transcendence. Uh, as we mentioned the other day, the, the roots or the seeds of self-clinging are still present, even though the actions have been pacified. So even though our actions and words have been pacified, uh, we uh, display less self-clinging. We still have self-clinging beneath the surface. Uh, uh, to remove those roots or seeds, we need the practice of the Mahayana. The Mahayana begins with holding the intention to become liberated, not just for ourselves, but for all sentient beings. We undertake the spiritual path for the benefit of all sentient beings. Uh, sometimes people uh, translate maha as great and yana as path, so they call it the, uh, the great path. Uh, but I don't think this is a statement of quality. It's not saying the Mahayana is better. Uh, uh, it's bigger. Yeah, it's bigger. I use the example of uh, the little Italian car, the Izetta, as being the Hinayana. Only holds one person. Yeah. Only holds one person. I'm showing how old I am. <laughs> These cars were made in the 50s. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, you can just put one person in there. Uh, uh, but then if you uh, get on a bus, you can put a lot of people on the bus. The single person car is the Hinayana. Uh, the bus is the Mahayana. But it's a really big bus because all sentient beings can fit on it. So that means that the, the person called the bodhisattva is really a bus driver. Uh, sorry about the joke. Bodhi means awakening. 
And so the bodhisattva practices bodhicitta. Bodhi means awakening, citta means mind. And uh, the attitude of bodhicitta is the attitude, I will attain awakening for the benefit of sentient beings. Uh, without this intention, we could still be doing selfish action. We could still be practicing our path to benefit ourselves alone. We could think, boy, I'm a good meditator. I'm doing really well. And so we almost uh, are putting a badge on ourselves saying, I'm really good. <laughs> so the idea behind the bodhicitta motivation is to let go of even clinging to peace. One does not cling to the idea of one's own liberation. Uh, one uh, works for the benefit of others without worrying about oneself. Uh, but this doesn't mean we don't take care of ourselves. Uh, we're a sentient being too. And we need to show, the bodhisattva needs to show compassion to all sentient beings, including themselves. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the practice of the Mahayana, or the vehicle for the liberation of all. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about the Mahayana, but before I do that, I want to see if anybody has questions about this first part. E gerando a felicidade e absorvendo o sofrimento com inspiração e inspiração, eu percebi que eu estava pensando. E a gente não tem que tocar o pensamento e não pensar, então eu não consegui juntar as duas coisas. Porque enquanto eu esperava, eu pensava, e quando eu esperava, eu pensava também. Understand. No, I understand the problem. Uh, just to fill in a little context here for the people who might be seeing this. Uh, Uh, this uh, video out of order. Um, uh, we're talking about the practice called Tonglen, uh, which is a way of meditating on compassion. Let's start by saying that. Okay, so uh, Tonglen means sending and receiving. It's a way of practicing compassion. It's a, a meditation. And so uh, it's very similar to Shamatha. In Shamatha, we allow the uh, breath to remain, I'm sorry, the attention to remain on the breath and we let go of all thoughts that arise. But Tonglen is actually different. We actually use thoughts in Tonglen. We use thoughts in Tonglen in order to uh, touch the idea of compassion and love. So Tonglen is different from Shamatha in that way. In uh, Tonglen, you actually think something as you breathe out and you actually think something as you breathe in. As you breathe out, you think, may all beings be happy or may this being be happy. And then as you breathe in, you think, uh, may this being or all beings be free of suffering. Alternately, you can think, I give my happiness to this being. Or you can think, uh, I take on the suffering of this being. Those are two different ways that Tonglen can be done. But both of these methods use thought. So in order to be undistracted, we stay with those thoughts. We stay with those thoughts and not with thoughts of, what will I do tomorrow? Uh, so for Tonglen, those types of thoughts should be let go. Uh, thoughts that are unrelated to the practice. Uh, for example, if you're doing Tonglen for all sentient beings, as you breathe out, you think you're giving all sentient beings happiness. And as you breathe in, you think that you're removing suffering from all sentient beings. While you're doing this, you might think of specific beings. Or you might think of parts of the world where there's a great deal of suffering. But this is not a distraction. It's within the context of the practice. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't try solving a problem from work while you're doing Tonglen. Does that, so, does that answer the question? OK. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Other, other questions? OK. All right. Let's see. I need to give you a little break. This might be a good time. Uh, and, uh, and so after this uh, five-minute break, we'll uh, begin uh, the teaching on the Mahayana. So get ready to have a very big aspiration. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, already we've talked about uh, the, the general points of Dharma and a little bit about the Hinayana, and now we'll talk a little more about the Mahayana and its path. Uh, uh, many of you are familiar with the term, uh, the Tibetan term, Lam Rim. Lam means path. Rim means gradual. 
when we first think about enlightenment, we might think it's impossibly far away. We may think of the Buddha as uh, sitting uh, placidly in meditation and say, how could I ever be like that? Uh, for us, the, the path to enlightenment seems as impossible as uh, uh, doing the pole vault in the Olympics. How can we run that fast? How can we put the pole in exactly the right place? And will we be strong enough to go over the bar and accurate enough to land on the soft landing place? I, I don't know about you, but I thought like that. It seemed that enlightenment was hard and impossibly far away. Uh, but this is the value of Lam Rim. Uh, by breaking down the concepts into smaller parts, uh, we can gradually arrive at the same place uh, with a, a small amount of effort that's uh, not uh, uh, heroic. <laughs> the method is uh, gentle for our mind. And so uh, uh, the Lam Rim texts teach the path to awakening step by step by step. Uh, there are many Lam Rim texts in all of the four traditions of Buddhism. I'm sorry, I misspoke, the four traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, uh, we are of the Karmakaji tradition. Our Lam Rim text is uh, Gampopa's jewel ornament of liberation. Uh, in Tibetan, it's called the Dakpo Tarjen. Uh, Dakpo is, uh, refers to Gampopa, uh, who is from the region of Dakpo in Tibet. Uh, Tar is, uh, um, let's see, help me. Tar is liberation. Okay, Tar. Tar is liberation. And Jen is ornament. So this is uh, a short name for the book. Uh, Gampopa, in his, uh, the book, uh, he wrote this uh, book in the, I'm going to say 11th century, but it could have been 12th. What is it, Lama? Yeah, it's it, it crosses over. It crosses over from the 11th to the 12th century. He died in 1153. Uh, this describes the path in great detail. Uh, Gampopa begins uh, with uh, the, the working basis for liberation. He says that the reason we bec can become awakened is because our mind possesses Buddha nature. He uses lots of examples. He says it's like the butter that is inherent in milk. If you uh, adjourn uh, the, the milk, the butter eventually arises. And so if we possess this Buddha nature and practice, uh, we will attain the result of Buddhahood. Uh, the, uh, the nature of our mind has been described by many masters. Uh, the example that has helped me the most was given by the previous Kalu Rinpoche. Uh, in his book, uh, that's, uh, he gives it in his book titled The Dharma. Uh, in uh, one of the chapters, he says that mind uh, possesses uh, three qualities. This mind, the mind that thinks this and that, it has three qualities. The first is that it is limitless. Uh, as I mentioned the other day, uh, some people use the word emptiness, but since that sometimes means zero, I prefer without limit or limitlessness. Uh, so the mind has no specific color or specific shape. <coughs> we can't find its beginning and we can't find its end. Uh, the mind I itself is not hot or cold. Uh, so it, in that way it is limitless. It is the source of all of our experience. Uh, but even though the mind is without limit, it's uh, not nothing. Uh, it, 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 it experiences and it knows. We have appearances that arise to our minds. We experience sounds and we experience tastes and touches and so forth. Uh, the body conveys that information through the senses. But it's the mind that experiences them. And so there is that quality of the mind that knows. And uh, Kala Rinpoche calls this mind's luminosity or mind's clarity. Uh, for example, uh, we can think of uh, the sun as an example. Uh, the sun uh, is a, a ball of fiery gas. Uh, it's like a nuclear engine continuously firing. It gives off rays of light. Uh, the sun and its rays are not separate, really. And so in this way, the mind and its manifestations are not separate. 
Our mind is limitless and yet it appears. Uh, the other example is the ocean. Uh, the ocean is vast and it's all made of water. On the top of the ocean are waves. When the waves heave out of the water, they might take a shape. It could be the shape of a swan or the shape of a monster. Uh, but it's all just water. It looks different when it rises up. And we might think, wow, that's not water. But it goes right back into the sea. So in that way, mind and its manifestations are the same. Uh, but what happens for us is we have confusion about this. Uh, we mistake uh, the manifestations of mind's luminosity to be separate from the mind. Uh, using the analogy of the ocean, uh, we surf. We're surfers. Yeah, we only stay with those thoughts and experiences. And we don't know what the ocean really is. So uh, this is a way of explaining the first two of the three qualities of mind. Uh, mind's uh, limitlessness and its clarity. Uh, the uh, third quality is, uh, it's called unimpededness, and I don't know how to say that, but it's, it's nothing, it's, it has continuity, continuity. Yeah. The mind can go around corners, nothing gets in its way. So uh, mind is limitless, clear, and unimpeded. Uh, if we uh, recognize these qualities, uh, we understand our Buddha nature. Uh, but uh, if we, but what we have to do is more than understand it. Uh, we have to not just understand it, we have to realize it. And we do that slowly and gradually through Dharma practice. But this is how we begin with the understanding that our minds have this potential. E every being has it, no being lacks it. All beings have the potential to be Buddha. Uh, the ability might vary, but the potential is universal. And so all beings are worthy of respect uh, because uh, they don't have to earn this respect. They have this naturally. They have this uh, potential naturally. Uh, they have this value naturally. So if uh, you or anyone else you know should ever suffer from uh, not feeling worthy, for perhaps not feeling good about yourself, the remedy for this is remembering your Buddha nature, which is naturally part of you and can never be parted from you. Even though we have confusion in our mind, our basic nature has never been stained. It's always perfect and pure. Uh, but like the sun behind the clouds, sometimes it's hidden. Our confused patterns of thought prevent us from seeing how the mind really is. Uh, Kala Rinpoche gave an example of this. Uh, you remember uh, we spoke about the three qualities of the mind? Uh, when we don't recognize them, we fall into confusion. Uh, this is called basic ignorance. Uh, uh, it is uh, the ignorance of our true nature. Uh, from this, uh, we then, uh, from basic ignorance, we proceed to habitual tendency. According to Kala Rinpoche, we misunderstand mind's limitlessness to be a self. Uh, as Sita Rinpoche said, we take the most vast thing in the world and make it the smallest thing, self. And we then misunderstand mind's experience as being the world of other. Uh, once we have self and other, we have drama. And this is the, the third uh, level of confusion. Uh, it's called the, uh, the veil of emotionality or klesha. Mm. And then uh, self tries to conquer other. And uh, in attempting to conquer it, we generate lots of uh, emotions, uh, attachment and aversion and ignorance, uh, pride, jealousy, and all the rest. And then this leads us to act. And once we act, we uh, accumulate karma. And uh, once we act, then we experience the results of this karma. So it's, uh, this, this cycle continues over and over again. Starting with, the veil, starting with the veil of basic ignorance, we move through the rest of them. Not seeing mind's nature, we posit self and other. That's the second of the veils. Uh, the veil of habitual tendency. Then we have uh, e, the veil of emotionality or klesha. Then we have the veil of karmic accumulation. So even though we have all of these veils, Buddha nature itself is never changing. It, it still can be known. 
it still can be known by us. And we can know it slowly and gradually through study and practice. Now, Buddha nature itself is not harmed by the veils. It's just covered by them. And uh, so this is the basis for all of our ability to practice the Dharma, is having Buddha nature that can know itself. Uh, I, I have a, a funny story to tell about this. Now, uh, because uh, many people in the West come from a, a Christian background, uh, we tend to, when we hear about Buddhism, we tend to still think about original sin. You know uh, that uh, man somehow, human beings somehow, fell from grace and became ignorant. Uh, so when people come to Dharma, they ask the masters, well, what happened? Were we once enlightened and then we fell from grace? They understand why this is important to us. Uh, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche gave a great answer to this question. He said, mind is limitless. And uh, so he said, it's not that we were once enlightened and then we fell from grace. It's that mind does not know its awakened nature right now. It's always there waiting for us. The reason that we have ignorance is because mind is limitless. Uh, if it wasn't truly limitless, it wouldn't have the capacity to not know itself. If it didn't contain ignorance, it wouldn't truly be limitless. He said, uh, for the time being, ignorance is like a, a sheen covering, a mere sheen, uh, like a shining, covering uh, our awakened nature. And we have not known mind's nature, so ignorance is still in front. Uh, but through the practices of the Dharma, we dispel this. And then the mind's basic nature is seen and known. It's not really that hard. Uh, but because of our confusion, we think it's really hard. But that's why we have a gradual path. Yeah, so that's, uh, this is my part of the answer. This is why we have a gradual path. Uh, that wasn't what Kempo said. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so what we have to do now is apply ourselves to learning the path. Uh, so then, uh, in, uh, if we go back to Gampopa's uh, Lam Rim book, he says that based on Buddha nature, then we can practice the path. If uh, Buddha nature is the cause of Buddhahood, then we have to practice the path that brings us to Buddhahood. And uh, this consists of uh, contemplating uh, all of our freedoms and resources. In other words, we contemplate how lucky we are to be here and uh, to be in this life and practicing the Dharma. We also think about impermanence and contemplate karma uh, so that we know how important it is to practice. Uh, then uh, Gampopa talks about the next stage, which is making contact with a spiritual friend. Uh, then uh, uh, after one uh, meets the spiritual friend, then one listens to the teachings of the spiritual friend. Uh, in his book, Gampopa talks about the qualities that spiritual friends uh, should possess, uh, such as learning and compassion and patience. Uh, he says that the very best uh, spiritual master is an enlightened Buddha. Uh, but if we don't have the karma to meet one of those, uh, next best is the uh, a partially awakened bodhisattva. Uh, uh, but if we don't have the karma to meet one of those, the next best is the ordinary being who possesses these qualities of learning, uh, compassion, and patience. In fact, in his book, Gampopa uh, says that uh, the ordinary being of all of these is uh, uh, the uh, most kind. Because being similar to, uh, to us unenlightened sentient beings, uh, uh, we have a good connection with them. Uh, and, uh, and practicing what they teach, we uh, get better and better. Uh, there's a book called The 37 Actions of a Bodhisattva. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. It was written by a great Tibetan master. Uh, and uh, in it he says, when, if, when in reliance upon someone your defects begin to wane and your qualities begin to increase, uh, to rely on such a person and treasure them more than life itself is the practice of a Bodhisattva. Uh, we may not have that kind of uh, uh, ability to rely on a spiritual friend in that way, but the, the point is, if we rely on someone and our defects decrease and our qualities increase, this is excellent. We know we're heading in the right direction. 
Gampopa in his book then goes on to talk about uh, the teachings that the spiritual friend gives, uh, the, the remedies to attachment uh, to this world uh, by understanding suffering, impermanence, and karma. And then uh, he gives the teachings on uh, how not to cling to the peace of nirvana. Uh, then Gampopa talks about taking refuge in the three jewels. And then he talks about the cultivation of bodhicitta. And uh, this is where I'm going to pick up. Uh, as you know from our teaching of the other day, there are two types of bodhicitta. Uh, there's ultimate bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. Uh, absolute bodhicitta is an understanding of wisdom and emptiness or limitlessness. And uh, relative bodhicitta is the cultivation of love and compassion. Uh, there are two other ways that bodhicitta can be divided. And that's aspiration and action. Uh, aspiration bodhicitta is the wish to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of beings. And uh, action is the uh, action, I'm sorry, and action bodhicitta is the action by which this Buddhahood is accomplished. Uh, bodhicitta is uh, sometimes called, has been called, uh, the elixir that abolishes death. Uh, in the 8th century, there was a great book written by Shanti Deva. And it was called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And uh, he, this, he called it the elixir that abolishes death. He says that when bodhicitta is applied to an ordinary being, it turns this body of flesh and blood into the body of a Buddha. Uh, so we must train in bodhicitta above everything. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Jangun Kantral the Great also spoke about this. He says, uh, don't even consider the ephemeral happiness of samsara. He says, uh, yeah, you could attain the nirvana of the Hinayana, but that's not enough. He says, consequently, we should strive only for the state of completely perfected Buddhahood. And, uh, and so uh, bodhicitta then is what we have to train in because it's only through bodhicitta that we attain this awakening. Uh, Jangun Kantral says, bodhicitta arises on the basis of love and compassion. Uh, and even after we attain full Buddhahood, there's nothing for us to do except work for the benefit of beings. So, he says, we must strive to work on love and compassion. Uh, the Buddha also spoke about this. He says, if you want to study the Dharma, you don't have to study many teachings. Uh, this is actually helpful for us in the modern day. Because if you go into a bookstore, there are dozens of books about Buddhism. If we try to read them all, we'll probably get more confused. So the Buddha made it easy for us. He said, if you want to practice Dharma, you don't have to practice many teachings. You only have to te practice one. And what is it? It's love and compassion. The Buddha said, whoever possesses love and compassion, he has the qualities of Buddha in the palm of their hand. So this is why a bodhicitta is important for us for training. It's what's going to turn us from ordinary beings into awakened beings. Uh, and most of you are familiar with aspiration bodhicitta, the wish to attain the Buddhahood for the benefit of others. And from your study of Gampopa, you know about action bodhicitta. He defines action bodhicitta as the six perfect virtues. Uh, generosity. Uh, ethics, uh, patience, diligence, meditation, wisdom. Uh, each of these builds on e the other. If you want to start letting go uh, of selfishness, generosity is a good place to start. And in fact, uh, my, uh, my master, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche, said generosity is actually pretty easy. He says, if you have trouble practicing generosity, feed the birds. Uh, they don't come up and knock on your door and say, thank you. You feed them without any expectation of reward or thanks. Uh, this is the best kind of generosity, the generosity that is marked with non-expectation. Because after all, we can practice generosity with a lot of selfish attitude. We can say, oh, I have given these offerings. Somebody's going to think I'm pretty great. I have been very generous to this person who has harmed me. Everybody will think I'm a great Dharma practitioner. Or you might think, I've offered this thing to somebody else. They're going to appreciate me. Uh, these, are, uh, these are examples of generosity slightly tainted by selfishness. Uh, in his book, Gampopa tells us step by step 
how not to practice like that. He tells us how to give, what to give, the right timing, the right attitude, the right gestures, the right state of mind in order to make generosity free of the taint of selfishness. These instructions are worth becoming familiar with. Uh, for myself, sometimes I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be nice sometimes. But then I go back to Gampopa and I remember it step by step by step. And in fact, Gampopa even tells you how to <coughs> practice generosity with complete wisdom and non-attachment so that generosity is practiced with the basis of wisdom. After all, wisdom is the final of the six perfections. Uh, but you don't have to wait to the end to practice it. You can start practicing it right now in a conceptual way. Uh, I'll give you one short example. Uh, you, perhaps you're giving someone a gift. In your mind, you can think like this. You can think, no giver, no receiver, no object, no action. And in this way, conceptually, you do not cling. It's conceptual, but it works. And it gives you the idea of how to give. Anyway, that's one short example. Uh, the, the second of the six perfections is ethics. Uh, if You can see how these build upon each other, because if you're generous, then it's easy to be ethical. It's easy to have stable behavior where you don't harm yourself or others. And if you have stable behavior, people trust you. Uh, whereas if you're unpredictable, people might even be a little afraid of you because they can't trust that you won't explode. So if you have a generous attitude, it's easy to be ethical. And if you're generous and ethical, it's easy to be patient. When you're generous and ethical, you understand both the faults of yourself and how faults manifest in others. And you can be patient with that. And if you have patience, then it's easy to be diligent especially if we can be patient with the hardships that come when we are practicing and studying the Dharma. You know, the hardships of boring speakers, the hardships of difficult concepts, or uncomfortable meditation cushions, uh, or a mind that's busy thinking, what will I do next? Uh, if we can uh, deal with all of these hardships, diligence becomes easy. And if we can be diligent, then meditation is not a problem. Uh, and if meditation is done well, then wisdom is the result. And once wisdom has been attained, the previous five perfections truly become perfect. And this is, uh, this is a way of summarizing the path of the six perfections. Uh, so uh, before I go any farther, does anybody have any comments or questions? Because we have a few minutes. <laughs> qualidade da parede da mente, né, ela estava explicando que a mente é como um oceano, e que os pensamentos são como as ondas desse oceano, é, eu não entendi se a mente, se ela produz as experiências ou ela só percebe as experiências. Essas experiências são, é, são produzidas pela minha mente ou, eu, ou a minha mente só percebe o que acontece? É, eu, a minha mente é que cria o mundo ou a minha mente é que percebe o mundo? Yeah. It's uh, actually a little bit of both. Uh, because uh, sometimes the mind is still, but sometimes the mind is moving. Uh, just as the ocean is sometimes very calm and sometimes has a lot of waves. So when the mind moves, we have the tendency to think that that movement is somehow different from the mind itself. Uh, sometimes when we first start practicing meditation, we aren't sure if the thoughts are separate from the mind. Uh, because we're cultivating peace, we're cultivating tranquility, we tend to see thoughts as distractions. Uh, but as we progress, we begin to see the nature of those thoughts. Uh, for example, in the practice of the meditation called uh, Mahamudra, we're taught to see the mind both in its state of stillness and in its state of movement. These techniques can really only be taught with a teacher, yes. studied with a teacher. Okay, so when you work with a teacher and they teach it like this, you can begin to see that the thoughts are not separate from the mind itself. And seeing that, thoughts are really not much of a problem. Whether the mind is moving or still, it's really no different. But I think I might be missing part of your question. 
Uh, am I missing something in specific? No? no. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking that maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Conceitua tudo e esquece, não é esquecer, é, ela não se percebe a si mesma criando esse, 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 esse holograma mental, essa coisa que a gente chama de realidade, que é a, a mente relativa. I wouldn't use the example of the hologram. I wouldn't use that example. But there's something similar here. It really does come down to stillness and movement. Mind is limitless, and yet it also has the ability or the potential to experience things. It knows. It has a knowing quality. But this is not separate from the mind itself. It's, uh, sometimes they use the idea that experiences and appearances are like the radiance of the mind. So, but I'm not sure that there's some type of intentional creation involved here. It's not like the mind is intentionally creating experiences. It's just having them. I mean, even when we sleep at night, we have experiences. I don't know that there's a little creation factory inside creating all of these dreams and thoughts that we have. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, similar to the example yesterday of the stage magician. We have all of these experiences, and we think we know how it's done. Uh, but it might not be the way we think. So it's not that the, the mind is intentionally creating all of these things. It's more like mind experiencing itself, its own luminosity. But because it's pretty intense, we think that it's somehow outside. Uh, one teacher said, experiencing mind's emptiness is too much for us. Uh, so uh, as a reflex, we create the concept of self. And because the intensity of uh, our mind's luminosity is too much for us to bear, we create the idea of an external world of others. But actually, we can actually think of our thoughts themselves as being other than us, which is why we sometimes feel victimized by our thoughts. So I think, I don't know if this is helpful. Yeah, it's all of those. Yeah, the mind is all of those. It's all of the aspects of everything. Even when we're sleeping at night, we experience something. Uh, through habitual tendency, we make it look a certain way. I make a joke about the movie analogy. I say that uh, uh, Mahamudra meditation is like walking up the beam into the projection booth. <laughs> but it's not really like. But it's not really like that. So I don't know. Did it help? Did it help a little? I don't know. <laughs> os nossos pensamentos e tudo que a, e tudo que a gente vê né, no mundo exterior como coisas que aparecem na verdade tem a mesma inconsistência dos pensamentos que a gente está produzindo eles são parte desses pensamentos também ou eles têm a mesma natureza desses pensamentos tudo só que em graus diferentes de solidez vamos assim para quem está para nós nossos pensamentos são só pensamentos mas tanto a cadeira, o chão, tudo que está em volta, todo esse ambiente externo também é com o nosso pensamento. Ele é, ele é digamos assim, é, ele é só esse filme que está sendo projetado também. Não, não existe nenhuma consistência, tanto nos pensamentos quanto naquilo que a gente acha que a gente realmente está vendo. É isso, é isso. Uh -huh. there, there are several schools of thought about this in Buddhism. Uh, as, uh, some say that there really is matter, material. Uh, some have another view. Uh, my personal feeling is that there's really water in this glass. But how I experience it is particular to me. Uh, a fish will find this a place to live. A drowning person will see it as the cause of their death. People from another planet might see it as poison. But for me, it's water. Yeah, so... Um, So for me, it's a, a relief of my thirst. So there's something here. But how I see it and how I experience it is particular to me. And my experience of it 
will always be internal. I can never own the cup. Even if my name is written on the bottom, I cannot own this cup. All I own is my impression of this cup. I cannot own another person, even if I wear a wedding ring. All I can ever have is my impression of what that or who that person is. Everything is always internal. So there may actually be something here, maybe not. But what's important is how we respond to it internally. Do we use this world and all of our thoughts as ways to become more confused or to become more awakened? So since I'm not a scholar, I can't talk about the different viewpoints about whether matter does or does not exist. But the part I'm certain of is this part about it, all of the experience being internal. Because in the end, uh, whether external matter exists or not, how we experience our mind determines how we experience everything. Yeah. And so uh, if we can base that experience on an understanding of truth and love and compassion, then we really have something. We can then stop clinging to things that cause us pain and understand the faults and failings of others. And we can stop creating an artificial world of blame and uh, avoid some of the causes of our own suffering. And that will help us be able to act with compassion toward others. This doesn't mean that we're going to let uh, bad people run amok and do everything they want. Sometimes the way to practice compassion is to stop people from hurting themselves and others. But while we do that, we can be watching our mind and try to keep our mind in a place of truth and compassion. I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, we're running a little low on time, but... We got but, it yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, sit for just a moment and uh, sit quietly. <laughs>